So what I'm going to talk to you about uh, is, um, has actually no mosses in it whatsoever at this point, although we are studying mosses. What we're going to talk about here is uh, the kind of research we're engaged at for the project, the reason I came, and the contribution that we're trying to make to the Murray-Darling Basin project in general. And so I want to motivate that whole thing to begin with by talking about just briefly introducing the importance of herbaria and kind of the reason that I came here in the first place in 2011 to start working on this because of some things that you have in Australia that are not present anywhere else. Australia leads in this uh, digitization of museum collections. So we're discovering now that we have the data available that taking massive amounts of data from the museum collections and making it available electronically in easily searchable and usable forms is leading to all kinds of new potential research. And then as many of you know, the cost of DNA sequencing have gone down so much that we can do phylogenetic efforts that 10 years ago would have been silly to even try. We can, um, we have the informatics now to connect the two, build really good phylogenetic trees of big data sets and connect them with these big geographic data sets. And the reason I came here in the first place rather than doing the work in the US is because Australia has managed to completely digitize its uh, herbarium collections uh, across the continent and we're just barely um, getting going the last few years in the U.S. So I hope to do it in the U.S. eventually. There are many uses of these databases, and I don't want to say that what we're doing is the, by any means the only thing. Many people here are taking advantage of these data in uh, various ways, looking at uh, change through time, phenology changes. It's turned to be a super important use of herbarium specimens seeing when flowering times were 100 years ago and 50 years ago and so forth. Um, looking at the uh, invasion biology, people use our herbarium all the time to see when pathogens first came into California. And then more academically, we uh, want to produce tools to allow people to identify the plants or animals in the place as the case may be. And then uh, those of us, oops, those of us who have more academic interests, uh, realize, and we were talking about this a little bit um, even in the noontime uh, discussion today, um, things like biogeographic studies, ecological studies, comparative ecology studies, we need to have both the data on a broad sense and phylogenies. But what I particularly want to talk about today, and I'm going to focus on to the rest of the time, is uh, assessing biodiversity, which seems like ought to be something that we can do already. But the trouble is, the Biodiversity is usually assessed, almost exclusively assessed, as a count of species or a comparison of species of some sort. So if I want to say how much biodiversity is in a place, I count up how many species are there. If I want to compare two places and say how similar are they, I look for how many species do they have in common versus how many do they not have in common. And what that does not take advantage of is our increasing knowledge of the tree of life. The best thing that species can be is one level on this tree. And often they're not even that if they're not phylogenetic uh, species. But at, at best, if they're phylogenetic species, then you have sort of a crazy hedge trimmer, a drunken hedge trimmer has gone through and trimmed this hedge. We know that in some groups, species are defined very fine scale. In other groups, for tradition's sake, the species are quite deep and large in an evolutionary sense, like in mosses. Most of the things we call species in mosses are older than what are called genera and angiosperms just because of the difference in biology. So we have, if we only look at biodiversity, think of it as we're only looking at it in a one-dimensional way. We're only looking at not necessarily the tips of the tree, but in this top of this crazy hedge um, that has been trimmed. And we have so much more information if we look at all the relationships, if we look at the relationships of the tips to each other, and so that's the kind of direction that we're going. It's not replacing the traditional way of looking at species because species are part of the tree of life. It's just they're not all the tree of life. They're just one level in it. So here's just a quick example of how you can have a disconnect between number of terminal taxa and amount of the tree that's covered. In both of these trees, there's something like what, maybe 14? There are 14 terminals. 
So if I have 14 terminals in some place, like in this park or that park, I might say, well, these two parks both have 14 species or whatever the terminal taxa are. But you see, they measure a different amount of biodiversity. 14 taxa that are in one cluster like this cover less of the tree than 14 taxa that are distantly related. These 14 taxa cover mo much of the tree. These 14 only cover a small part of it. So there's a, a disconnect. The absolute number of species tells you something better than knowing nothing. It tells you something. But unless you know the distribution of those species on a phylogenetic tree, it doesn't tell you very much. So the traditional metrics are 99% are species-based. And what I'm talking about here are methods that have been developed and also developed mostly in Australia, which is another reason I came here, by uh, researchers having access to these kind of databases and measures of phylogenetic diversity, phylogenetic endemism, and uh, so forth. Virtually every measure is Australian uh, derived, which is also very interesting. And I wonder if it connects up with having the availability of all that uh, distributional data. Okay, so um, just like biodiversity per se, biodiversity counting is more than just species, so is endemism. And I think you'd have to say that endemism is even more focused on species than, than just diversity counts are. They're almost synonymous to a lot of people. When they talk about endemism, they're talking about whether a species is restricted to an area or not. But of course, clades at any level could be endemic. By endemic, we mean having a restricted range. So we should sort of define, uh, we should define endemism much more broadly to not just talk about the terminal taxa, but to talk about the branches of the tree. And you could have a lot of endemism in a place because the whole branch of a tree that's in that place is rare, not just the terminal taxa. And that's this concept of phylogenetic endemism that was also developed in Australia by Dan and others. So basically for both these issues of diversity and endemism assessment, we need to look at the whole tree and not just species. This is really a rant against species, because you know, which I will do I think a week from Friday. But this is basically just saying that even if species are perfectly good phylogenetic units, there's still not everything. There's still depth to it. So the important measures that I'll be uh, throwing around here, I'm going to go into in more detail than this, but the major measures, original measures are uh, PD, which is phylogenetic diversity. That's been around since the early 90s. Uh, Dan Faith at the uh, Australian uh, Museum had, was the one who's um, first thought of this, and he's applied it. Many other people have applied. There are a couple of papers that just came out recently on this. So PD, and I'll show you a tree to calculate it, but PD, it would be the part of the phylogeny that's in a place. So how much phylogenetic diversity is in that national park? It's basically what percent of the tree is in that national park, counting up the branches and the branch lengths. Phylogenetic endemism is only defined since 2009, paper that Dan was first uh, author on, um, another, another good Australian measure, which is related to PD. The way to think of it is it's PD of a tree that you've weighted by how common or rare the branches are. And I'll show you an intuitive example of how to calculate that. And then there's a couple of more derived measures that we started working with in 2011 when I was here on sabbatical. Uh, which I'll get into why do we have to do this, but the, um, in developing a full-on hypothesis test for what do you expect PD and PE to be, you have to take into account factors such as how many terminal tax are in the area that you're talking about and so forth, so we'll get to that. So I'm going to talk about, these are the main measures, and then I'm going to talk about these derived measures here that, um, so if I say RPD, I'm talking about relative phylogenetic diversity. It's basically more in a statistical framework, you're saying how much PD do you have in a place based on a null hypothesis of how much you should have in that place. So this is trying to get at more of a, a significance level. When you just look at PD, you don't, raw PD doesn't tell you that, basically. And the best software, again, uh, this is Sean Laffin's group who's up at University of New South Wales. Uh, excellent software for looking, this, looking at this is a software that's called Biodiverse. So I wanted to show you on a simple tree. Uh, for some of you, this will be really obvious, so just bear with me. But if you haven't thought about this before, it's something you need to kind of see visually, at least I do. So I just wanted to show on a really simple tree. 
this only has five terminal taxa, and it only has that many branches, seven branches. It has, we're just going to say we're picking three. So let's say our global tree has five, and now we're talking about some area that only has three of them. How much of the tree does the three that I pick sample? Well, it depends on how they're distributed. So PD, another, another thing I should say is that all the analyses I'm talking about here, the branch lengths are scaled so that they add up to the total length of the tree. So in the original units, which are DNA, amount of DNA change, you divide each branch by the total length of the tree so that when a branch is 0.25, that means it's 25% of the length of the tree. So the branches, if, unless I made a math error, should all add up to one. And part, part of the reason we do that is to allow comparison between really different groups where the, the trees are going to be kind of arbitrarily different uh, in their length. So these are trees that are scaled to the total length of the tree. The relative length of the branches is the same in the original data. So that's one thing to point out. Then depending on which three terminals that I pick, I'll get a different PD. And if I on purpose pick the three longest branch taxa, you can sort of see intuitively how this is going to be the longest possible PD you can get for picking three taxa. It's 0.9. And what that means is 90% of the tree is sampled if I pick those three. Alternatively, with such a small tree, you can kind of pick the ones that are the shortest. And if I do that, it turns out with this tree and picking three tacks of the shortest PD you can get is 0.55. So PD, if you randomly pick three, is going to range between 90 and 55. Is that clear? And then this is one that's kind of in the middle. So you can just sort of picture how you could generate a random unexpected distribution by pick three, pick three, pick three, and see uh, what range you get, okay? Now I want to show you, before we go too far on PE, because for some reason people have a harder time understanding PE than PD. Uh, it's <coughs> a little more complicated, but it's really uh, not that complicated. So now take the same tree, and the red numbers there is the range size of those terminals. And uh, we're, we use grid cells, but that wouldn't have to be grid cells. That could be any units. But <coughs> this one only occurs in one place, and these guys occur in five places. That occurs in two places, and that occurs in four. Okay? So these are widespread as compared to these, and this one's pretty narrowly restricted too. So how would you turn that into PE? You basically would take, these are the original branch lengths, scaled to add up to one, right? Now, if I divide each of those branch lengths by its range, I get PE. So if I take 0.2 and divide it by 4, I get 0.05. This one, if I divide it by 1, its branch is going to stay the same. And so the way the tree would end up looking, uh, drawn to scale, would be something like this. This branch is going to stay the size it is because it's only in one place, so it has a lot of phylogenetic animism. This branch is going to be relatively long as compared to the other ones because it's only in two places. But all these other branches that are more common have <coughs> shrunk down. And if you magnified that part of the tree just so you could see it, you can see what the relative branch lengths are in this tree relative to this one. All you've done is range weighted. You've taken the branch length divided by range. Is, is that clear? Sure. Here? Yeah, what have you divided those? So uh, that's a very good question. What do you, it's easy to see what you do with the terminal branches. What do you yeah. do with an internal branch? Its range is the union of the ranges that are descended from it. Okay. So we don't actually know from the data I gave you. The range of that branch is at least five, mm -hmm. but it might be seven, depending on if it's, are these sympatric or not. So if these are allopatric, then the range of that is seven. But if those two are among those five, then it's only five. Okay. So, it, so it sort of takes into account um, the sympatry and allopatry of these things. So I probably should have shown a little map up there for it. So to make these calculations, I kind of guessed at that and yeah. picked, picked yeah. a number. But that's a very good question. So it, the effect of that, since the range is the union of the ranges above it, is that the branches get pretty small as you go down. 
because you're sort of accumulating commonness as you go down. You can see how tiny this is roughly scaled to the same scale as this one. So the, tree, the whole tree has gotten shorter, but some branches have gotten shorter than others. So you're downweighting the ones that have widespread range. And then all you have to do is take the PD of that tree. So this makes it, I think, easier to understand that PE is a kind of PD. It's just PD on a tree that you've adjusted for the ranges. So when you say you have high, obviously any branch that incorporates this, any selection of taxa that incorporates that branch is going to have a lot of PE. So now if I take an area, I would do the same thing. I say, okay, there's three taxa there. I would add up the length of the subtree that you get from those three taxa, and that would be the PE. And so uh, hopefully that's kind of clear. Now, what about this RPD, RPE stuff? What, what's, why can't you know, those work by themselves? The trouble is we don't know what to expect. So if you look, this happens to be the genus Acacia in Australia, and the reason we're using that for the first test case is because I'm pretty sure that's the group that has the most specimens. What was the total number of specimens countrywide? It was 40,000 or? 700,000. Or maybe it was, no, not 700,000. That, that many? Okay. So there's a lot of data for this one, whereas a lot of plant groups are not as well collected, but for some reason, eucalyptus and acacia are extremely well represented in the herbarium. So, and also we picked this one because Joe Miller, uh, who's not here today, uh, over at CSIRO has a phylogeny. This has over a thousand named species within Australia, but he has a phylogeny for just over 500 of them, which are in here. So this is PD for, uh, it's 25 by 25 kilometer grid cells, right Carlos? Yeah. For the whole continent. And the heat map here is how much PD there is. So okay, there's a lot of PD there and there's a lot of PD here and concentration in there, low places. But um, the map doesn't really tell you what to expect. And you worry when you look at the uh, terminal taxon reach richness, the species richness, looks very similar. And it makes sense that if you select five taxa from a, a tree that has 500, it's going to just by chance sample less of the tree than if you select 50. If you select 50 taxa from a tree of 500, you're likely to sample you know, quite a bit of the tree. So we need to develop an expectation. Here's the same thing with PE for acacia. This is um, PE here, and this is endemism of the terminal taxa. So this is your standard species endemism measure. This is phylogenetic endemism measure. You go, oh, they're pretty similar. Again, but we notice places like here where there's really high PE and there's not particularly high species endemism. So anybody have a guess like why, how could that possibly happen? How could you have high phylogenetic endemism without particularly high species endemism? The things that are there have really long branches. Yeah, so the rare things have really long branches, which is uh, something we were really vitally interested in actually. And likewise, you have places like this where the endemism you'd see from just the terminal taxa looks pretty high, where it's not that high in, in uh, PE. And then you have places like here where it's high in both. It's like super high in both. So I'm going to come back to this slide later after I show you the more analytical stuff with the hypothesis test, and we'll come back and these all sort out to be in different categories. Okay, since there isn't, for, like for a lot of problems in uh, biology, ecology particularly, there's no known distribution of what PE should be like. It doesn't necessarily follow a normal distribution or something. So like a lot of problems in ecology, we have to develop our own null expectation of what should it be. And I want to go over this kind of slowly to be sure everybody understands the randomization that we're currently using. It's certainly not the only possible one, but it's the one we're using, which there's about 3,000 grid cells in that uh, map. If you took all the species off the map, you got 3,000 grid cells, and you refill the map with two constraints. One is that each grid cell gets the same number of species. So if it had three before, it gets three. Each species goes in the same number of bins, so its range doesn't change. 
but otherwise it's random. So basically what's happening, a grid cell that has three species is getting three species picked at random from the tree and stuck in there. And then again and again and again. Because what we're trying to assess is what, what do we expect given sort of holding the number of terminal attacks a constant. We're doing just like with those trees with the blue circles on them do. And then we want to compare the PD or PE that we observed to what we expect. But to do that, you have to, since these are phylogenetic measures, they have to be measured on a tree. They don't exist independent of a tree. So what is a reasonable tree to use to compare the real values with to get your expected? One thing you can do is use the same tree. You can basically say, my null expectation is my real tree, and I've just picked three tax or five tax at random over and over again. What PD do I get? And you can do that in biodiverse. That's extremely dependent on the um, structure of the tree that you have. So it's not the most generalizable sort of thing, and it doesn't let you test some of the hypotheses we want to. So what we wanted was um, these relative measures to use a more general sort of a tree that could actually have um, or compare better across different trees. So these are both essentially ratios that are comparing in the numerator the actual value to some denominator, which is the value you get on a null tree. And I'm going to show you the one that we're going to use uh, for now. We've looked at several different ones, but this is kind of the one that we like the best. OK, so I'm just going to show you one here for simplicity, not saying it's the only possible one. This is just to remind you what the actual tree looks like again. This is our actual tree. So one kind of null tree you could have would be to say, well, what would I get if all branches were equal? OK? So you keep the topology of the tree the way it is in the real tree, the actual tree. But you adjust the branches to all be the same length. So you say, what's my PD on my actual tree versus my PD on this tree or my PE? So see, all these branches are exactly the same length. And remember, they add up to one. The PD, I don't know if you remember, the PD had a broader range in the actual tree possibilities than it does in this. Given that the branches are all equal, the possible PDs you can get is a narrower range. Does this make sense? You see what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to compare the PD I have in the real one with the PD I get on kind of a neutral uh, tree that my real tree has all kinds of differential branch lengths. This one doesn't have differential branch lengths. They're all the same. So then RPD, for example, if I pick the three taxa, I look at their PD on the real tree, and I compare it to their PD on the null tree. And I look at this ratio. And then, of course, I have to do the randomization to really know if it's significant or not. But probably, this is not significant. We would only know after we did the um, re-picking re three taxa over and over again. But these are, are kind of similar. Whereas if our real tree, the selection of taxa that we have in the real tree is, happens to be these three, then this ratio is uh, much bigger. See, the expectation of RPD is 1. If the real data match the null data, you should get the same value for both. So if you get greater than 1, it means the real tree has more asymmetry in the branches, kind of, that are present. If you get less than 1, it means they have less. This one probably would turn out to be significantly high. And this would probably turn out to be significantly low. Here your PD is only 0.55 with the real tree, and it's 0.75 on the, the null tree. So now what we're going to do, this may seem very esoteric, like who cares about this, but uh, I'm going to show you the reason why you'd want to care about this, about this measure. What can it possibly tell you? OK. so. Now we're shifting into explanation from just looking at patterns. But uh, as she said a minute ago, if you have a high RPD, like a really high RPD, that means there are more long branches in that place than should be there if the taxa were being stuck in there at random. It means you've got lots of long branches. Does that make sense? Now, there's possible, there are different possible explanations for it. Always in science, you know, you get a pattern and you have to apply other 
um, pieces of evidence to, to decide what's the most likely explanation. But one possibility is a biogeographic one where we're talking about maybe a refugial sort of place. In the, in the uh, US, a place like the Great Smoky Mountains is like a famous place for long branches because it's the only place in the continent I'm not really sure about Australian geography as much, but it's the place that has been available for plants the longest of every bit of the surface area of the continent. So it tends to be a museum of older lineages that are kind of sitting there. So that's what we mean by a refuge. So it could be that. But there's a very interesting ecological explanation that could be the case upon further study, which is this, um, I'm sure you guys are aware of this community phylogenetics, which is a whole big um, field right now. And the point of that is looking at the organisms that co-occur co in a community and asking these kind of questions. Are the ones that co-occur in this pond, are they, do they have the relationships to each other that you'd expect if you chose them at random? Or are they more closely related to each other than they ought to be? Or are they more distantly related than they ought to be? And if they're more distantly related, that's the signal that uh, perhaps competition would lead if, um, if Gauss's principle is correct, which close relatives can't coexist, then you'd expect close relatives not to coexist and more distant relatives to be able to coexist. So the ecologists are actually using these kind of measures. When we're looking at a 25 by 25 kilometer square, that's not really a community because there could be a bunch of acacia communities in that. So this is just an approximation, but it could be a signal of competition that you're actually seeing and if you see the other extreme, where you have significantly low RPD, that's where you have too many short branches. You have more short branches than you should. So that would have alternative explanations. This could be some place where there's a bunch of very young lineages that are just, they're short because they're recent. And there's an ecological explanation of it, the opposite of the um, sort of phylogenetic overdispersion is this phylogenetic clustering where close relatives are living in the same place. And that's usually explained by what's called um, habitat filtering, which if a big clade all has the same growth requirements, then you're going to tend to find them living together. So when we do this on the California flora, you find a lot of cactaceae growing in the desert. So the plants, you know, there's just a few major groups of plants that like to live in the desert. So there's not a random selection of all possible plants. Okay. So this has a possible explanation as well. So you can see that the um, RPD, even though it seems esoteric, it's giving you a first hint at least at ecological process and or biogeographic process. So here's the map for acacia. The blue areas are places where there's um, longer branches than there ought to be. And the red places are where there are shorter branches than there ought to be. And this is just a reminder Obviously, the real tree has 500 twigs on it. This is not the real tree. This is just our little practice tree. But as it turns out, the acacia tree has, I couldn't even show it to you on one screen because it's 500 taxa, but it has mm -hmm. relatively a lot of length in its terminal branches. Tree shape turns out to be really important in influencing these measures. So a tree that's very kind of branchy and has relatively short internal nodes compared to um, the nodes toward the tip uh, will have a certain set of properties versus um, other tree shapes. But this is our, our null tree shape is kind of in the middle. It's saying all the branches are equal. So this is what is being measured. It's the ratio of what you get on the real tree, which happens to have that shape, to this one. So you can look at these, and it's probably a mixture of ecological and biogeographic um, explanation for why you would be getting over dispersion or under dispersion of a phylogenic relationship. But I hope you can see that this would be really interesting, at least would be the first pass on a continent scale to let you zoom in to areas like we're going to do with the Murray-Darling Basin. So now we're going to go in and we've done acacia for the Murray-Darling Basin alone, you know, which I'll show you in the, a little bit later. Okay, now RPE is from what I'm interested in even more interesting because one thing that's been a, a kind of a long, I learned this when I was an undergraduate and that was a little while ago, the 
Uh, in California, people have been very interested in trying to understand the difference between neoendemism and paleoendemism, where neoendemism, as you can see here, neoendemism is, is this idea that an organism is restricted in its distribution because it's a young lineage that just hasn't moved out very far. So in California, we have all these serpentine barrens that have, have uh, name species that would fit in the spatial area of this room, and uh, they're considered to be very young, a very short branch. Whereas paleoendemism in our flora would be something like the coast redwood, which we were walking among in, that, uh, in the video, which has an extremely long branch. From the fossil record, it's known to have occurred all the way across North America and occurred all the way over to China and Japan. So paleoendemic is conceptually a really long branch rare taxa which has shrunk down maybe perhaps from its, so it's endemic now um, to a very small area but may not have been through its whole history, okay? So people are very interested in this. There are pa many papers written on this, but interestingly there's never been a quantitative method to try to tell them apart. And we think this is the method that does it on the landscape scale. So if we do the same comparison we just did and now we map out RPE, and we look for significantly high and low with the randomization test, then as it turns out, and I'll show you on our simple example why this works, that when you have high RPE, what it means is that you have an overabundance of rare long branches. And when you have low RPE, and uh, you know, I'm not giving you the details quite yet, but the punchline is that it's uh, a place where there's a lot of rare short branches. So what this lets you do on a landscape scale is say, here's a center of endemism that is dominated by paleoendemism versus a center of endemism that's dominated by neoendemism. This is not designed to point necessarily to specific clades, but is a, a property of an area. Can, can I ask you a question about that? Sure. When you're calculating your RPD and RPE, are you doing both those randomizations, the one where you shuffle the species around between grid squares and the one where you create this equal branch link tree? Um, is that, I mean, is that no, they're being work? done. Yeah. They're being done at the same time. So basically, what we're doing, the randomization is just the refilling the map, mm -hmm. and then what Sean has in the output from that, you can calculate. You know, the PD on the the real tree. You can calculate the PD on several different null trees that we have. So it's it's output in the randomization. You're just you're taking the sample of taxa that you had and you're just calculating PD or PE on the null tree instead of the real tree. So it comes out in that table from the biodiverse output. So you can just, if you want to, you can make a ratio or you can map either one. Or you can do, I'll show you, you can graph them against each other. So, well, it might, let me just go ahead to a graph and I'll show you what I mean. And I also want to point out, this is something I don't think I told you about, Dan that in order to really use RPE in the way I just described, you actually have to do a two-step process. So what we're doing now is, and all this comes out of the same randomization. So we first look to be sure a place is either a center of paleoendemism or, I mean, not paleo, but uh, phylogenic endemism or kind of weighted endemism or both first. And then those are the centers of endemism. And then of those, we apply the RPE test to separate them. And I could go into the details of why we do that. So we basically have, if it passes that first test, then we look for that RPE ratio, which parses them into three categories. You have centers of endemism that are dominated by paleoendemism, centers of endemism dominated by neoendemism, and ones that are not dominated by either, which have aspects of both and we're calling those um, super endemic sites. So let me just remind you again how PE is calculated. I just want to convince you that the RPE um, measure works. So I already showed you this slide. This is just how you get PE from our, our uh, sample tree that we had, our cartoon tree, okay? So that should be familiar. Now all we're gonna do is just follow a couple of branches. We happen to have, because I chose it that way, we happen to have a really rare long branch in that little simple example. This is a uh, long branch and it also happens to be rare. This was one of the shortest branches on the tree and it happens to be rare. Okay, so what happens? So, and, and this gets to your question. So now we do the range weighting 
So we take that tree and adjust the branches here. This is range weighted and you see how this has gotten relatively long compared to its sister because this one's being divided by five and that one's only being divided by two. You can see the relationship between the sisters has changed. So here's what happened to our rare short branch and here's what the rare long branch is still really long. Then we measure the PE of the null tree, okay? And remember this, the original branch length of this is 0.125, okay? So if you look at these two branches and compare it to those two branches, the take home message is that the rare long branch is longer than it ought to be according to the null, tr null trees. This 0.25 should be 0.125, whereas the rare short branch is shorter than it ought to be. So that's how come RPE will separate out the rare long branches from the rare short branches, because the rare short branches are shorter than they ought to be in the range-weighted tree, and the rare long branches are longer than they ought to be. Does that make sense? It's kind of a busy slide, but that's, that's the take home. So now if you do the RPE of Australian acacia, same data set, actually same randomization, then you see these um, interesting things that that we have two levels of purple here. Those are two different significant levels. We have the ones that are significant in both, the, basically the numerator and the denominator of RPE um, to the 90.95 level, and then the deep purple is the 0.99 level. So these are s centers of super endemism. And then we have a few locations, including one that should look familiar up here, and some in here and down here in Tassie, a little bit right over here, that have significantly rare long branches. And then we have other places that have significantly rare short branches. Okay, so this, what this is doing is showing centers of endemism and is partitioning them into three categories. And then this view, and I think this helps understand what uh, Dan was just asking, this is the numerator and denominator of RPE. And both of these uh, would come out of the randomization, although these are the real values. I left out, this is only the significant grid cells. We have one of these that has all the randomizations in it, but it's, so it's got a big cloud of points in here. Um, but these are the ones that turn out to be significant. So the y-axis here is the actual PE on the real tree, okay? And the axis here is the PE on that null tree. So you can calculate it on the same data. This is calculated on, you know, the, the real value, not the randomized one, just to show the difference between these. And then if we did overlay all the random data, and there's a whole bunch of non-significant, these are only the grid cells out of 3,000 that are significant. There's a whole pack of them down in here. So the way to look at this is the ones that are up in this end of the distribution are the paleoendemic centers, and the ones that are over here are the neoendemic centers. And then all these ones in the middle going way out here have really super high uh, measures of endemism in both uh, numerator and denominator. So does that make sense? Kind of what we're doing here. So we're, we're looking, really this gives the same exact information as the map. Those are the same points just put into a different space. Here we're looking at a ratio. I mean, here we were looking at a ratio, whereas here we were looking at the numerator and denominator separately just so you can see how it works. But uh, I think it's pretty cool. Okay, now, so here's our map of RPE again. Now to go back to that map we started with just kind of motivated intuitively, it turns out that that area up there that had really high PE and not very ex high um, species endemism is one of the sites identifies a paleoendemic site. And then this site down here that had very high amounts of uh, species endemism and not particularly high phylogenetic endemism is one of the neo-endemism sites. And then this area right here that seemed high in both is one of those points that's way the heck out there is really high in both. It's like way significantly high in both. So you could, um, you know, in terms of explanations, what looks like happening, you know, this obviously is not a new discovery. That southwestern Australia is one of the world's most diverse places. And it looks like what's happened to make it so diverse is perhaps it served as a refugia. So it, it does have these long branch tax, long branch endemics, which 
are indicative of probably some um, you know, deep history. And it also has a bunch of neo-endemics. So it's a place where active evolution of new lineages is happening. And it's also a museum where old lineages are, are being uh, you know, kind of kept up. We have a few places like that in uh, California, too, which is another one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. But to be a super duper biodiversity hot, the, the Cape, Cape of uh, South Africa is like that, too. It doesn't only have new endemics. It has a lot of new endemics, but it's also got groups that were much, much more widespread. Uh, this is a uh, paleoendemism is a feature of continental islands as well. Tassie was not super high in paleoendemism in this particular group, although it had some. But uh, theory predicted for years that continental islands like Tasmania should be high in paleoendemism because they might have refugial lineages that have kind of hung on there that have gone extinct on the mainland. They do seem to be a hot spot of um, animal and plant paleoendemism. Okay, so we're done with the PE and PD stuff. I did want to show you another use of the phylogenetic trees in a related technique, because we're doing this for the Murray Darling study too. Uh, when you take basic ecology, everybody's used these metrics before. If you're going to compare two areas and say how similar they are, these are two uh, measures you could use. And this is basically A is the species that are in one place, and B is the species that are in the other place, and C is the species that are in uh, both. So what you're basically just doing is kind of what, um, how, how similar are these in the species complement they have. And it turns out there's an exact uh, phylogenic an analog of these where instead of counting species, you just count branch lengths. So I could say, here's a grid cell, here's a grid cell. How similar are they? It's how much of the tree they share. Okay, so it's a measure of similarity, geographic similarity. So another nice thing Biodiverse does, and if we had Biodiverse live here, you could um, explore this even better. But this is a screenshot from Biodiverse, and the cells that are being compared here are the ones that were significant centers of endemism only, either neo, paleo, or super. So that's why we're only comparing those cells, but you could compare all cells. And what's going on here is this is a cluster diagram. This is not a phylogeny. This is a cluster diagram that's showing how similar the cells are in the phylogenetic tree they share. So it's a cluster diagram that's using phylogenetic similarity basically as the measure. So um, there's a broad relationship between um, the southeast and the southwest. And it's, there's a, quite a different group of, uh, of the grid cells up in here. And if you click around in a live biodiverse, like if I click on this node right here, it recolors the points above that. So that's only looking at one of the clusters and saying, okay, that's where that is, and that's where all the, the subclusters are. Going back to the whole tree. And then if you click on this green, this big green cluster here, and just reallocate that. So biodiverse is a great tool for exploring, just visually exploring biodiversity data. This is uh, totally cool that the cells that are here in this biodiversity hotspot are sharing similar parts of the tree, and they're quite different to the um, areas that are just north of them, this area, and that's well, this is a well-known biogeographic break kind of at the wheat belt. So up here in the Pilbara are um, clusters or grid cells that don't have nearly as much similarity with these. Okay, so to, um, to jump to, um, and I want to leave some time for discussion and questions and things. What are we doing with the Murray-Darling Basin? These are slides I borrowed from Carlos, which I think he borrowed from the overall project. So you probably have seen this before. This is why do the project. And this is the Murray-Darling Basin uh, outlined there. We're doing one of the sub-projects within theme two, which was basically uh, assessing biodiversity for conservation purposes. And in particular, what that is about is um, sort of three big areas. One is doing the kind of analyses of biodiversity and endemism that I've been talking about. But we also want to do a bioregionalization, which would be when I was showing you that cluster diagram that was only comparing the centers of endemism, you could use it to compare all the cells. 
and you could actually make uh, biogeographic breaks for bioregionalization based on the phylogenetic um, turnover. And I'll show you that in a second. Then uh, species distribution modeling and uh, genetic population structure within, uh, particularly within the aquatic organisms, is part of the overall project. But what I've been talking about today mostly deals with this. So the bioregionalization, uh, I should probably have Carlos talking about this. This is his slide. But the idea is we are looking at terrestrial organisms, riparian organisms that tend to be down by the streams, and then actual aquatic organisms that live in the streams. And the kind of overall goal of this, and we're working on a number of different uh, organismal groups, the overall goal of this is to see is there congruent patterns across really different taxonomic groups. So that's pretty cool. And see if there's any signal you can pick up between a terrestrial and aquatic organism do they, on this regional scale. So we want to do bioregionalization, we want to look at endemism, we want to look at biodiversity, and so forth. This is what we've done, one of the things we've done so far. This is acacia. It's actually derived from the same data set, the same distributional data set, same phylogeny, but this is just for the basin. I'm also really interested in comparative patterns across these. I'd like to know whether the patterns you see with acacia on the continental scale are the same patterns you see in this more local scale. But these would be using species turnover. So I, I think everybody's um, seen turnover maps before. That's where the issue is just if you go to the next cell, how much do you change? And so if you don't change very much, you stay the same color. So a place where you change color is kind of where when you go across that boundary, you change a lot. It's sort of an edge recognition. So depending on how fine scale you want to make it, you can recognize uh, two or three. This one might have an area up there too. So this is species turnover. This is phylogenetic turnover. They're correlated with each other as they should be. And remember the turnover here is not how you're changing a number of taxa. It's how you're changing in the branches of the tree that are there. So one, one real interesting difference between these, this one's more forgiving in the sense that if you don't have the same species in two places, it doesn't count as a point of similarity. But you can imagine you could have two really close sister species, and one's in one place and one's in the other. That's going to give you phylogenetic similarity because, after all, they're just really close to each other. So it's not quite as harsh. This demands that you have to have matching of species. This is just saying, kind of, do I have a representative of that branch? in both places. So we actually do get, we, you know, these, we've done the bioregionalizations on the continent and also in the basin, and you t tend to get uh, nicer uh, turnover measures with the phylogenetic measures rather than the species one, because again, it's based on the whole tree. And there's a new method, I, I don't think this is using the range-weighted phylogenetic one, because that hasn't been published yet. That's the paper we're working on. But you can, with both of these, you get biased by the common organisms, either the common species or the common <laughs> branches. So Sean Laffin is uh, leading uh, a theoretical approach which would be um, kind of weighting the rare branches count more. So turning over in a rare branch counts more than turning over in a common branch. So it's sort of a range-weighted um, approach like this, kind of range-weighted phylogenetic turnover. But they do tend to give you nice uh, bioregionalizations. And this is Carlos's um, diagram of some of the things that uh, seem to be happening. So we do see centers of new endemism and paleoendemism on this uh, regional scale. This is only two organisms. This is only eucalyptus and acacia. But what we hope is when we add a lot more that we'll be able to see whether a center of paleoendemism in one is congruent with a center of paleoendemism in another group, which might tell you something about process. And then you can get into, especially on a local scale like this, trying to understand the causes of distribution. That's slipping into the interpretation range. Um, this is the geology. This is elevation. This is depositional environment and looking at that and trying to correlate it with where do we see our centers of endemism, where do we see our biogeographic um, boundaries, the breaks in the bioregionalization.
And uh, we put this in just to prove that we're actually working on something for spending all this money. That uh, what we're working on this month is individual PD and PE studies of individual groups in the Murray Darling Basin. And so far, we've worked on eucalyptus acacia, a data set that we have that has all the, uh, I think it has all the vascular plants, so ferns, conifers, angiosperms, uh, and a, a big giant tree, and then fish and frogs. Well, we hope to add some more by the end of the month. And then we want to do these meta-analyses I just briefly uh, alluded to, which would be after you've done the separate analyses, then looking to see are there centers of paleoendemism or neoendemism that cut across uh, groups? And then this idea of doing a regionalization, of trying to um, take the basin, put biogeographic breaks in it based on both species and phylogenetic turnover, and then make some, you know, overlay that with protected areas and so forth, and make some practical conservation uh, recognition. The concept of complementarity, I'm sure you guys have all heard in conservation biology lectures. If you're using complementarity for reserve design purposes, if I already have two reserves and I'm going to build a third one, if I'm assessing with species, I want the third reserve to have as different of a set of species as possible from the first two. So that's this idea of complementarity for conservation, to try to spread your reserves out in such a way that you cover species diversity. You can do the same thing with the phylogenetic turnover. You can say, okay, here's my protected areas. Now what's the next area that should be protected? It would be the area that protects the, the most of the phylogenetic tree that's not protected in the other two. So you want the most dissimilar on that PD turnover to the ones you already have. That makes sense? So you can even use the phylogenetics for like reserve design and so forth. And, um, there's a story to this shirt, and this, uh, this is actually my research group here. I think this one's uh, Carlos there. But uh, so what we're going to do when we get these initial analyses done, we're looking at ways to compare the analyses. Um, there are many other null models. That one tree that we're using, there's other <coughs> obvious ones, including developing a random tree. So there's other null, null trees that I want to look at. and. Um, the measures of PD and PE that have been used so far, because of historical reasons, if nothing else, measure all the way to the base of the tree. So you take the path among your tax and your selection all the way to the base, which tends to make them more similar. So what Sean and I have been talking about are local PD and local PE measures, where you just do the path among the terminal tax and don't go to the base. It gives you a much bigger range of possible PDs. And uh, so we're going to see how these measures look if we applied local measures. And then what we're going to have to do to really fully understand the properties of this, I have some slides which I'll show later in discussion if we want to, but tree shape makes a huge difference. So the symmetry of the tree and the distribution of the branch lengths makes a huge difference in what you expect for PD-based measures. And probably the only way to really understand that is going to be to simulate trees that have known properties like really asymmetric, really symmetric, branches all deep, branches shallow, and so forth. So we're hoping to do that maybe even before I go, or at least get it started. <clears throat>